Hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. It's breaking a little bit. Um, hear you. All right. Welcome to the webinar on building a land information ecosystem in India, co-hosted by the Center for Policy Research Land Rights Initiative, the Land Portal Foundation, NRMC Center for Land Governance, Omidya Network India, and the Thomson Reuters Foundation. An information ecosystem is a vast and cluttered space, more so when it comes to land in India with its myriad federal, state, and customary laws, and a clash of traditional and modern systems as the country gradually moves towards conclusive titling. What data exists in India? Is it up to date? Is it reliable? Who owns and controls the data? How can it empower people? To help make sense of this complex legal, economic, and social structure in which land in India is governed, we are very pleased to have with us today a set of expert panelists who will address some of these questions. Uh, my name is Reena Chandran. I'm a journalist with the Thomson Reuters Foundation, and I will attempt to moderate this session. Joining me remotely today are Namita Wahi from the Land Rights Initiative at the Center for Policy Research, Shreya Deb at the Omedia Network India, and Pranab Chaudhary of NRMC and the Center for Land Governance. Um, I will have a brief interaction with our panelists and then invite questions from participants. Please use the questions feature to pose your questions. We'll try and make sure that they're addressed in turn. Okay, Namita, let's begin with you. What makes the land data system in India so complex and complicated? Thanks, Rina, and thanks uh, to Land Portal for organizing this webinar and uh, for all my fellow panelists for joining in. Uh, I think, uh, Rina, your, the question that you're asking is has many facets to it. So the first thing is that when we speak about land data in India, um, I most of what we are referring to is government data and i think the first thing i'd like to note is that government data not just pertaining to land but with respect to other aspects as well has for the longest time been a black hole you know uh, prior to the enactment of the right to information act of 2005 most uh, government data was not available uh, publicly in an online accessible form now pursuant to the rti act there are obligations on government uh pursuant to section 4 and uh, the report of the task force for implementation of uh, the RTI Act to actually proactively disclose all data in, in, in the public domain. But uh, even though there is this obligation now, uh, at the same time, we find that while state, uh, various government departments have been trying to comply with this obligation, particularly with respect to land in India, as you rightly noted in your introduction, that you know the, the land is a state subject uh, under the Indian constitution. What it means is that you know different states have different laws relating to land but there are also some subjects relating to land which are in the concurrent list which means that both the union uh, parliament and state legislatures can make laws on that so we actually have a multiplicity of legal regulation relating to land and at the same time uh, a multiplicity of administrative practices relating to land because many of these administrative practices date back to the colonial times and uh, much of the administrative manuals with government departments have not really been updated uh, consistently. So that's the first uh, sort of big problem, the, the sort of absence of publicly available data. The second problem being the dispersal of data across multiple, uh, you know, government departments and uh, various uh, repositories that exist. And then, uh, the, you know, so the, the third problem is outdated data. So we find that even with respect to say some uh, land records, which now the government is trying to digitize first went to the DLRMP, the digitization of land records uh, and modernization program. We find that in many states, uh, not so much in the Southern states, but in the no Northern states and in the Northeastern states in particular, uh, land surveys have not been done uh, for, for like decades. So in Bihar, for instance, they haven't really uh, got done updated land surveys completely since the 70s. And so basically a lot of the data is inaccurate. So I would say uh, first is the absence of publicly available data. Secondly, the multiplicity of sources and absence of consolidation. And the third is outdated data. Thanks, Namita. 
Shreya, given these challenges, what's keeping us from thinking more urgently about these challenges and acting on them? Um, thanks, Reena. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I've been working in the space for a few years now, and one of the things that strikes me is just the, the lack of understanding about these issues among most people, the general public, and even some very smart intellectuals who have great ideas about, you know, the economic policy, how education needs to be transformed in the country, but they don't, you know, they've never really engaged on the issues around land. Um, and perhaps one of the reasons why that is so is because a land or a property transaction, it only happens a handful of times in someone's life, I mean, probably once or twice. You know, it's only when you have a transaction buying or selling, that's when you really grapple with the process, with the challenges and with the lack of data. So it's not like you're dealing with it on a daily basis, unlike, you know, say uh, it's like, like banking or, you know, under, underwriting a loan or even education Are my children running, uh, learning well in school. You don't deal with it on a day to day basis. So perhaps that's why people don't realize it's an issue and that's why not too many people are engaging on it. Um, in, I mean, you know, over the last few years, I've had conversations with some very, very uh, smart and experienced people from the industry, like a banker who would who asks me, well, why do you even need a map when you're, you know, buying a property? I mean, you you just know there's a CTS plot number. Why is why do you need a map? Or uh, someone else who's like financing some large real estate projects, and they'll say, oh, we don't take any land title risk. We are only financing the building that's being built, and we'll only do it once all the permissions are in place. Um, or but on the other hand, it's the people who actually grapple with it on a day-to-day -day basis, which could be a real estate developer. Uh, someone was telling me that, you know, when I'm looking to buy a land plot for the next housing project that I'm going to build, every document that I have access to tells me this plot of land is 40,000 square meters. But I've got the government surveyors to come in and survey it multiple times. I've used private surveyors to survey it. Every time I get a different answer of what the actual area of the plot is and none of those areas match what is there on the official documents so at some level this is really deep it's kind of it's uh, you know just understanding that there, there are these inaccuracies in the data uh, once we understand and acknowledge that i think that's when we'll start moving forward in terms of finding solutions great thanks Shreya. um Namita, um, how has a lack of land information affected communities? I know you have some examples of this. Uh, sure. So, I mean, to, to put this into context, you know, when we talk about uh, lack of land information, we are talking about information at various levels. The first is at the level of law itself. The second is in, at the level of administrative practice. And the third is at the level of judicial decision making. And uh, at each of those levels, so to just give you an example, uh, you know, we don't even know how many laws on land there are in India. And uh, if, if, for instance, uh, you know, uh, there are a series of laws that were enacted during the colonial period. Now, in the post-colonial period, the government has enacted a series of other laws, and there are multiple conflicts between these kinds of laws. So when I'm, if I'm a community or an individual, for that matter, there's a plethora of uh, legislation that is applying to, to me, possibly. And I don't know what are my rights uh, under uh, some of those uh, legislation which have perhaps been enacted more recently, but they have not been really put out into the public domain. So if I don't know the extent of legal regulation, then that's a level of disempowerment to begin with, uh, you know, because what that then means is that if there are two laws, one of which protect my rights and another which doesn't, the government can decide which law to apply. And I, I because I don't have that knowledge, uh, I'm not able to counter that. Then at the level of administrative practice, so under laws, we have uh, rules and delegated legislation which the executive makes. And many times, you know, it, it's, it, we, it's important uh, to sort of understand what uh, this delegated legislation does, because many times the delegated le legislation may actually derogate from the existing law. But it is the delegated legislation pursuant to which the executive is going to function. To give you an example, under the earlier Land Acquisition Act of 1894, the law clearly provided that, you know, uh, people have to be paid market value compensation, even the previous law did. And uh, and it was also said that while assessing market value, the collector should look at circle rates or they should look at uh, the average of registered sale deeds or both.
But in terms of the delegated legislation that many of the states, uh, you know, put out, usually people were looking, uh, you know, the government was really looking only at circle rates and the circle rates were, were inaccurate. So, you know, the, the compensation was not, in, was not adequate. Now, for example, if, if people were aware of, uh, you know, people were aware of the legal requirements, they would be able to sort of challenge the executive as well when they are not complying with that. And finally, the fact of the matter remains that, you know, in India, we've had, um, you know, two narratives over land. One is the state or the government's narrative, which has been basically what the colonial state's narrative was, that all land that is not privately owned belongs to the government. The other has, of course, been the people's narrative. And by the people, I mean people who are dependent upon the land. So not necessarily people like us who are in urban centers, but uh, the large, vast majority of India's population is still dependent upon agriculture and other land related activities like pastoral, um, pet, uh, like pastoralists, forest dwellers, um, fisher folk and, uh, you know, cattle grazers. So many of these communities are dependent upon their land, but their rights are not recognized. To give you an example, uh, we, we have, uh, you know, the fisher folk. Uh, community uh, in Gujarat, who I represented in litigation uh, many years ago against the Bundra port. I mean, in, in, in the case of the Fisher Folk, you have the Department of Fishing that has given them these fishing permits, a person to which they, co they collect the fish, right? And yet, when it came to uh, building the port and acquiring the land and the, uh, and the mangrove forest land where they were doing this fishing, you know, their rights were completely not recognized. And so even though they have these fishing permits, they have hutments uh, to which the government actually provides water and sanitation services during the months that they are there fishing. They're not there all the time because of the monsoon season. So they have to, during the monsoon season, they're not there. But the rest of the time, the government itself recognizes their existence on the land, provides them these services. But when it comes to acquiring land for a project, they completely de-recognize them. So I, I think I'll stop there, but of All course right. there are other Thank examples you. of forest rights. Um, sure. Uh, if, so there are examples of forest rights where, you know, where, where first of all, there are disputes between the forest department and the revenue department, you know, whether if something is forest land to begin with. So the revenue department has given these people revenue receipts because they've been paying revenue for all these years. But the forest department claims that this is forest land and therefore it comes to evict these people from the fo from the forest land. Now, really, this, you know, the, the government can fix and uh, fix this, right? You know, the forest department, the revenue department can really figure out which is their land, uh, uh, which is the land of the forest department, which is the land of the revenue department. But for the people in question, you know, they've been living on the land for decades and they've been paying revenue and they have these revenue receipts. And yet that is not regarded as proof and they are evicted. All right. Thanks, Manita. Um, Shreya, I wanted to come to you for some solutions at this. I know you've been looking at this area in terms of how we address uh, how to improve exchange and engagement with land data and information. So what are some solutions that you have um, found along your way? Um, sure. So, you know, we've, we've actually seen some very interesting uh, solutions that a few uh, state governments are, have been adopting. Um, say Odessa very uh, recently had um, decided that they will Shreya. give land type. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Hi, uh, Rina, I'm sorry. Are you able to hear me now? I can hear you, Shreya, but I don't think Rina can. Maybe I'll just continue. <laughs> um, uh, hang on, we seem to be having some kind of technical problem here. Um, all right, um, Namita, why don't you talk to us about the, uh, the projects that you're engaged in for improving the exchange and engagement with land data and information? Sure. If you can hear me, um, so we we decided that you know uh, the first building block of understanding regulation relating to land is the actual law itself, and yet we uh, we don't have the laws in the in the public domain. You know, central government has the uh, central um, uh, government parliament. They have actually put out a list of laws and uh, that are central laws. 
but uh, neither the Department of Land Resources, which is the central government department, does not have a list of all the landlords that are, uh, you know, applicable, uh, you know, pursuant either to uh, the parliament's enactment of those laws post the constitution or pre-colonial laws, which were by the central government. At the same time, the state governments also vary a lot in the in whether they have put out the applicable state laws in the public domain. But certainly there was no consolidated repository of land laws. So what we did was that we started with uh, uh, with putting together a database of central laws and then the laws of eight states. So we chose these eight states to uh, to have sort of geographical diversity as well as diversity in terms of the kinds of land. In terms of the kinds of land. Uh, that they have because you know land is a very diverse thing there are uh, land can be in uh, and because it's geographically diverse the regulation of it is also diverse so we have you know coastal land we have mountains we have forest land we have uh, agricultural land we have common lands which are not uh, under agricultural use but are uh, being used for uh, other purposes like pastoral uh, uh, pastoral and for cattle grazing and so on and there are different laws applicable and then of course there's urban land and then there is uh, you know industrial uh, uh, land on which industries are there so uh, so essentially we uh, chose eight states including punjab in the north gujarat in the west andhra pradesh and telangana in the south Bihar and Jharkhand in the east, and Assam and Meghalaya in the northeast. And the idea was to at least put together the laws of all of these uh, states because they represented these different kinds of land, both geographically as well as from a regulatory standpoint. For instance, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Gujarat uh, also have, uh, and of course, uh, Jharkhand also have land under the fifth schedule. And the northeastern states of Assam and Meghalaya have lands under the sixth schedule, which has a completely different regulatory framework under the constitution itself let alone other laws. So essentially, uh, when we started out, I uh, didn't expect to find so many laws. And, uh, you know, we, we found that there were over a thousand laws for just the center and for these eight states. And so we can imagine that now, like for the for 29 states, uh, how many laws there will be. But, you know, we can easily estimate that there will be about two to three thousand uh, laws that we might find. Um, and so that was the first step, and it was a it, it was not an easy step. We used a, a various, uh, uh, you know, uh, we tried to uh, access these laws from various sources, including, uh, you know, uh, both the the government sources. We filed, uh, you know, the libraries that the governments have, um, the databases. Some of them have put them up online, and then also we looked at, um, we looked at, we filed RTI requests. We we spoke with stakeholders, and we found, you know, regulations that are really not. There, uh, you know, uh, that the government doesn't use so much, but that are there and communities are using. And so it, it was a pretty mammoth uh, undertaking to put the project together. And the idea now is to sort of um, create an architecture which we can put out in, into the public domain, but put it out in a way that is accessible to not just lawyers, uh, not only lawyers can make sense of it or people with specialized knowledge of the law, but that would be accessible to the general public. Can you hear me? Uh, Shreya, can you uh, tell us about your experiences with improving this um, approach to um, accessing information and data? Sure. Um, we've actually seen some good examples um, in a few states. So one was Orissa, um, where they implemented the Jaga mission, which was which aimed to give titles to over 200,000 slum dwellers across the state. and uh, they did this really in a very interesting manner. They used drones um, to fly uh, across the whole state, collect information about all these various uh, households and map them. And then on the ground, they partnered with NGOs who were using the Cadasta app to collect the household level information. So they put in a lot of effort to collect uh, information about the households, map them on a proper map, and then started to distribute um, land rights certificates to them. Uh, so that's, I think, something really innovative. We haven't seen it anywhere else in the world. So that's uh, at the scale. 
Um, so that's something very interesting that the, that the government in India is actually trying to do. Rina? Yes, I mean, I sorry. Can go on about um, <laughs> No, let, well, let's go on to um, some more success stories while we're still trying to get Pranab online. I do apologize for this. We've been having massive technical difficulties. Um, so um, we, we've been talking about a fairly gloomy scenario with uh, data that's not recorded properly, absence of data, lack of accessibility to data. But there are success stories. And I know you have, you've seen and experienced many of those. Um, so Shreya, do you want to talk about some success stories that you've encountered? Absolutely. Um, I think, as I mentioned, the Orissa one is one which is really uh, massive at scale. But another one that is very interesting and not really being talked about too much is what the Telangana government has been doing. So in 2018, the Telangana government declared, um, so th th they decided to offer uh, direct cash transfer benefits to all the farmers across the state. It's a little over one, one and a half million farmers across the state, land owning farmers. Um, and they wanted to do this. Uh, it was a scheme that's designed that um, that the cash will go directly into the bank or bank account of the farmer. And it was linked to the area of, the, of their land holding. And for them, while this was uh, a scheme that was announced in 2018, the preparation for it started much in advance. So in 2017, the state government launched a massive statewide operation to update land records. And across the state, in a manner of, matter of three months, which is quite remarkable, um, they managed to update all the records. Uh, there were, of course, a few records which were in dispute, so they kept them aside and said, we'll deal with you in the second phase of the program. But in the first phase, they managed to cover, you know, they, at least probably over 90% of the records across the state. Um, and once this database was created with, you know, um, reliable information, this was then passed on to the agriculture department, who then used it to ensure that uh, direct cash transfers were made to all these uh, small and marginal farmers across the state. So that was a fantastic example of how land information was used in a, in a very solid way to actually uh, provide welfare benefits by the state. Um, another one which is very recent um, is um, one of our uh, partners, NCAER, is doing some very interesting work on comparing how effective is the land record uh, digitization process across different states. And they, this is an extremely comprehensive st uh, study that they're doing across all the states of India. And uh, in this process, they found that there are a few states who have um, digital land records available online, but they're not necessarily signed and digitally and uh, legally usable. And when this information was presented to back to the states, one very proactive state uh, bureaucrat just picked up the phone and you know, gave an order saying, well, make it available online. It was. It hardly took any effort on the side of the government. Uh, all you know, all you required was to just present this evidence, have it in a way that the you know the right people in the right uh, positions were able to see and process it, and they reacted to it. So it's very useful to start putting out information and evidence if you really want to drive uh, change. Great, thanks, Shreya. Pranab, uh, since we finally have Pranab online, um, I'm gonna. Uh, hand the floor to you for a little bit in terms of the challenges that you faced with uh, data collection and how this hampers progress uh, in improving land governance. Yeah. Rana? Thank you, Rina. Uh, this is about uh, while trying to collect data uh, for mapping land rights uh, of women in the context of SGZ. We had some insights uh, the way data ecosystem is organized in India. And later also when we try to, with land portal, try to do the state of land information report, we also had some understanding. I'll just quickly briefly uh, uh, you know, uh, say that. When you look at the uh, quantitative data available uh, availability around women land rights, we find in India there are no, uh, it is quite data rich. So there are a lot of data sets available. One is the agriculture census that FAO does every five years. So that provide operational land holding, which not exactly the ownership. And it also provide data set with respect to head of the household, not exactly you know family members. 
but nevertheless it's uh, provide data every five years and it has granularity up to district level and it provide a general disaggregated and caste designer data and it is uh, almost 100 percent uh, now population covered uh, whole india in contrast to that there are some other data sets like in india human development survey take, uh, taken up uh, by every five years again it goes to sub family level there is also nfhs data uh, which provides uh, women property ownership there is also socio-economic caste sense, uh, census uh, taken up in uh, 2011 which also talks about uh, women cultivators and landowners so if you look at this data set no owners. data set directly directly refers to the directly land ownership to records the land but they are derived uh, they are derived right. from no uh, other uh, from no, surveys or other data other sources. Surveys so in a way, data, data, data rich here, uh, here to compute uh, women land right uh, based women on land right criteria, right, we don't uh, find adequate. Based on criteria, we don't find adequate. The situation in India, which is data rich, says so India, which something. Is data rich, says so something. Yeah, there is some echo, so I can see. Yeah, there is some echo, so I can see. Sorry, Arina, uh, now can I, okay? I could use from that? Yeah, yeah. Now there seems yeah, to think... be some echoing there. Yeah. There seems to be some echoing there. Okay, Pranab, while you fix that, can I just um, Pranab, while turn... you fix that, can I just um, turn? All right, hang on. Um, Pranab, while you fix that, I'm going to turn to um, Shreya. Shreya, you did you have some um, other? Shreya, you did you have some um, other to the previous um, question? Inputs to the previous question. There's a massive echo there. There's a massive there. Sorry, Namita, can you talk to us about the Sorry, Namita, um, can you talk to us about the um about the work that you're doing? About the work that you're doing in terms of improving sure. access in to land information. Access to land information. Sure, Rina. So uh, we do have some success stories to talk uh, to talk of. Um, the first uh, was our land acquisition report that we put together and released in 2017. This report was a comprehensive study of all Supreme Court cases of land acquisition from 1950, which is when the Supreme Court came into being, until 2016, which was the time period of the report. And we looked at 1,269 land acquisition cases to identify why was it that people were going to court and what was problematic about the provisions of the earlier land acquisition law, which had then been replaced by the new law. But there were, you know, there was a lot of policy um, uh, sort of turmoil about the new law because it was believed that it was going to be very counterproductive to development and investment and everything. And we really wanted to understand why were people going to court and how was the court adjudicating these disputes and how could we think about this issue in a, in a way that would actually resolve uh, the reasons why people were going to go were going to court to begin with. I'm happy to say that the report has had a significant impact. First of all, it has made this information, uh, this this land, this comprehensive land data available. Um, but also, you know, what, what uh, our goal was that, you know, um, just putting the data out, like if we put out this data set of uh, 1000 cases, that doesn't really help. What, what does help is that if we analyze the cases to identify the particular issues so that both the litigants and the government and the judiciary can understand what is really going on. And, uh, you know, we've had, uh, 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 as soon as the report came out, I've been getting calls, uh, and even before the report came out, actually, I've been getting calls from um, litigants all over the country who were, who had found out about the report. Um, the report is in English. Um, many of those litigants didn't speak English, but they still had come to know of the report and had access to the findings and were using them in litigation. And then at the same time, uh, you know, the, the issues with respect to interpretation of uh, Section 24, which is a retrospective application clause of the Act, had, have led to a lot of litigation under the new Act as well. And uh, this issue has now, uh, you know, in 2018, went up to a constitutional bench, which has been hearing the case. Uh, it was hearing the case last October and November, and we found out that the Solicitor General actually cited that uh, our report 
in uh, before the Supreme Court. So basically, we have multiple stake stakeholders uh, using uh, this database, whether and, and from uh, in, including litigants against the government and also government in making its claims before the court. The second uh, uh, database that we put together was a database on the schedule areas. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is an area which you know these are areas which are demarcated under the constitution under the fifth and sixth schedules of the constitution, but you know the Ministry of Tribal Affairs doesn't have a map of these areas, doesn't really have information uh, that they are aware of or they have put out on how much uh, geographical land in area uh, geographical land in India is in the scheduled areas. So uh, what we did was essentially, and that's also because, you know, the districts and the administrative boundaries of districts have changed over time. And, uh, but, you know, the, the information is available in the census and it is available to the government. So what we did was we went through a painstaking exercise of identifying exactly what are the current districts and parts of districts that are within the scheduled areas. And so uh, based on that, we were able to create a map of the scheduled areas. Uh, based on that original map, we were able to sh uh, show, uh, you know, sort of map the forest cover in those areas, the mining activity in those areas and, and the dams, that uh, the dam activity that was coming up and able to show correlations with forests and dams in scheduled areas. And once this report was out, it is being used extensively again, both by the ministry, um, the National Commission for Scheduled Tribes adopted the report as part of its annual report under the constitution the year that it came out. Subsequently, the, you know, the National Human Rights Commission has referred to the to this. I have worked with the Jharkhand government recently in drafting a tribal sub plan law based on the information that we put out in this report and other report. And of course, it is being used by civil society organizations all over the country. So these are two success stories of work that we have done, which has actually had a policy impact and has also empowered people to ask questions that have then led to the kinds of policy impacts that we are seeing. Great, thanks, Anita. Um, I'm going to take Great. up thanks, a Anita. few of the questions. Um, I'm going to take up a few of the questions from participants before we move on to a final set of questions. Before we move on to a um, final set of questions. From Kunimaka um, Sissoko, how are civil society organizations involved in the process? I'm guessing it's yeah. in the collection of data. I'm guessing it's in the Does collection of data. Answer? Does someone want to answer that? Well, um, I can take a shot. Sure. Sure. So, I mean, I guess I'm, we consider all of us perhaps on this panel are part of civil society organizations. And so I think the response to the question would be exactly uh, what we've said thus far uh, about uh, the work that we have been doing in trying to, uh, to figure out this data, whether it's a land loss database or the land acquisition disputes database or the schedule areas database, as well as the other other databases that uh, Shreya referred to, the work that NCAR is doing, uh, you know, all of these are civil society uh, organizations, and uh, they are basically trying to uh, use whatever information is available in the public domain and also sort of, uh, you know, scour out other information that may not be and, and try to put together these databases and put them out publicly. Rina, can I respond to this uh, couple of questions? Rina, can I respond to this uh, couple of questions? Okay. Okay. Are you done? Sorry, my audio is in and out. Sorry, my audio in and out. Yeah, in the we have a question yeah, on what data sets are we What data sets? Sorry, Pranav. Yes. Sorry, Pranav. Yes. Yeah, uh, regarding the caste data yeah, set that uh, regarding the caste data set that the that Rakshan Kumar has asked, so agriculture has provided so uh, agriculture data set about the caste particularly for civil for civil land for civil land data set available as per the land data set available as per the land and this is available like uh, I, I told it is every five years and it is available up to sub district wise uh, information. Uh, and then coming to uh, the, the last uh, question regarding Westlands, yes, uh, India follows a ninefold uh, classification, uh, FAO's ninefold classification. And 
Uh, as per that, there are some categories of wasteland like culturable waste, unculturable waste, barren and rocky lands. And this classification is data set is available almost every year and it is available for uh, sub-district level in India. And it is easily available uh, 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 from different websites, regularly updated. Uh, there are also now uh, this uh, satellite based uh, data which is coming into uh, supplement that earlier it was collected through the Department of Statistics. Now it is collected. And just to briefly respond to the first question about civil society in India in data. So civil society in India collects a lot of data, but they remain as gray data. They never get integrated into the mainstream data systems. So far, all the data which we use or curate are collected and disseminated by the government. Because the government of India has a right to information policy where they start voluntary disclosing of all the data. So most of the data are available in the websites to in public domain and uh, also in a digital form. Though they are not in the open data format always, but they are available either in PDF or sometimes in Excel. Government of India is now trying to put them in XML and GeoJSON, but it is a long way to go. But the data are primarily, to conclude it, the data is primarily created and disseminated by the government, which is fairly available. But civil society data is not available in a public domain, which can be you know, used by others. Um, Rina, if I may just add on to that. Uh, there is one civil society organization which is called FES, Foundation for Ecological Security. They have actually now recently taken on the effort of putting a lot of their data away available openly for others to use not only their own data this is an open platform that others can even contribute to so it's called indiaobservatory.org.in and uh, it actually has information about the barren land fallow land etc that fes has been collecting over many decades it also integrates a number of public uh, data uh, government data sources as well Thank you. Um, there's a question from Raksha Kumar on uh, what data sets give out caste figures of land ownership. Is this the um, SEC data breakdown? Yeah, I already responded to that. It is one is agriculture census that is providing the data set every five years. Right. Okay. Socioeconomic caste census also provide, but it is only one year, 2011. But uh, agriculture census data provide broad categories, scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, and other caste. And it is available every five year up to sub district level. All right, thanks, Prana. Um, there's a question I'm from Dr. Um, 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 on the wasteland. Do we have data on wasteland for country wise and state wise? Wasteland yeah, and that, land. That's the one that yes, I. Uh, yes, yes. Reena, uh, responding to that, actually, FES's indiaobservatory.org.in contains a lot of information about okay. wasteland and family. And as Prana mentioned, it's also government data. This data is also available in many government websites, and it, the data is available up to sub district wise, this land use classification data, which provide all kinds of data about wasteland. So, this data is fairly easily available. even. Uh, in gray, uh, in also hard copies they used to available earlier. Now it is in online. So the wasteland data availability because in India way back in 1985 they developed wasteland atlas of India. So India has a good data availability on land use. Very very good data availability and it goes up to sub district level. Okay, thanks Pranab. Um, I had a question for um, everyone. Um, what is the future that you see or would, would like to see for land data systems in India um, in, in a perfect scenario? What, what sort of future do you envision for land data systems in India? Um, anyone can go first. Shreya, do you want to go first? Sure, Reena, happy to. Um, I think the ideal state definitely would be that if we can have a land record system that is accurate, reliable, when you read it, you know that this is the right information about the ownership, all the rights associated with it, encumbrances, mortgage, liens, whatnot, everything is in there and the map um, actually reflects what's on the ground. So I think that's the holy grail that we would love to aspire to. But there's another idea that we've been thinking about, you know, for so long, it's been the, the government has been the custodian. 
and has been responsible for maintaining the records, updating them. And clearly at some level, you know, uh, government capacity is perhaps not where it needs to be to ensure that this is, you know, kept updated and, and in a way that is useful for everyone. And there is merit in thinking about property records and land records as a, a club good, uh, as, as economists think of that concept of a club good, um, which, you know, a lot of, which then ensures that there is a sort of a, a partnership that's possible between the private sector and the government. Uh, government will, of course, need to play the role of a regulator overseeing, ensuring that citizen interests are protected. But to some extent, the onus of the operations, maintenance, etc., can be shifted to the private sector. And hopefully the use of more technology in this process can lead to a more uh, you know, future ready land information system in India. Thanks, Shreya. Uh, um, Pranab, do you want to add to that? Yes, yes, uh, Reena. Uh, I, I think there are three things which are very critical at this juncture because what government has started is a kind of very good initiative by opening up the information ecosystem through RTI and digitalizing the data. But what government provides is a one side data, and like other sectors of you know, finance, population, socioeconomic sector, we need to see in land sec, uh, data also role of uh, non-state actors, particularly civil society, academia, in bridging that gap and also complementing, supplementing. For example, if you look at ISDS, India Human Development Survey is a civil society initiative which is creating a sample survey data set. NFHS is also a non-government in initiative. So in that country, we need to see how non-government initiatives are coming up around land data. There are a lot of land data collected as a grey data by NGOs in the field, academicians, and it is now important with you no know, big data ecosystem coming up, how we bring this data and how we curate and how we supplement the government data. Second thing is important is that building capacity. Uh, while government of India has open of the data ecosystem and uh, now moving towards open data policy, we see the lot of data is not available in open data format. Data standards vary, interoperability vary, many times data are there and then the data is removed. So there is also a requirement to see how you know, different actors can be able to scrape the data They and the data is put in a format which is interoperable because if, if you look at land record, land record data is the biggest database in India. There are issues around spatial data, but the textual data is one of the best source of data, but they are in different languages. So one find it difficult to really you know, make it cumulative and you know, so, so, so some kind of comparative analysis. So in that context, what is missing here is the capacity of the state actors where uh, government need to invest and also civil society and others need to complement and supplement so that the capacity building of the land uh, you know, ecosystem act actors who are involved in collecting and managing data that is also required. So that, that is the second initiative which on which more you know, work need to be done. It had to also a kind of component of mapping these actors. Third and not the least, as the data is getting open and more available, land data has also a personal data involved in, in that. So in that context, the data of ethics and privacy comes in. Government of India is now working on a draft policy to you know, control personal information. And they uh, envisage that the personal information will be stored in a server in India. But as, as you look at most of the data being collected around you no know, land by non-state actors, they have servers in cloud servers and which is available uh, elsewhere. And particularly when you collect land data, even many private sector and uh, NGOs, they collect the data. They, there is lack of free prior informed consent of the person providing the data. So in that context, a lot need to be done. And uh, now the way data ethics and privacy uh, need to be addressed and increasingly we are making invis uh, invisible data visible, particularly in the context of indigenous communities and other areas. So these three things I think uh, are critical to address if you really uh, want to improve the land ecosystem in India. Thanks, Prano. Um, Namita, do you have anything to add to that in terms of what you envision for the future of land data systems in India? Sure. Uh, so, Rina, to add to what Pranab and uh, Shreya said, I think that there's definitely a role that uh, civil society can play in helping the government put this data out. I do want to um, strike a cautionary note here in the sense that, uh, yes, indeed, state capacity has been an issue with respect to 
multiple areas of government functioning. But I think uh, the, the larger issue that we also see in our work is that there is state unwillingness. So, um, you know, it, uh, uh, it, the Indian state has often been described as, uh, as a cunning state in the sense that, you know, sometimes when it decides to do something, it can do it. Uh, but often when it uh, is unwilling to do something, you know, there isn't a lot of effort put into put into that. And I think that we have to be aware of uh, of this aspect of it. When we think about state and private partnerships, and when we think about bringing technology in, because none of these things are neutral things. And even the, especially with respect to land management, like I said, it's it's uh, with throughout our colonial history, there has been a government narrative and there has been a people's narrative. So it's not as if, um, you know, the, the state itself has not been neutral with respect to land management because there has been a constant tussle between the, the people and, 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 and the state with respect to, uh, to their rights over the land. And these have been recognized over a period of time by various legislation. So we have, uh, for instance, the Forest Acts of the 19th century and the 1927 Indian Forest Act, and you know, which asserted the government's control over all land and, and, and said that all forest dwelling communities were essentially illegal. But uh, after decades of struggle, we have the Forest Rights Act of 2006, which has actually recognized the, the property rights of forest dwelling communities. So, you know, the, to, the, so, so basically like this is a contested space, even in terms of whose rights are there and whose rights are not. And even after this new law came into being, recently there were proposed amendments to the Indian Forest Act, which would have again given a lot of powers to the state to dispossess and evict people. Now, these amendments have been rolled back for now, but we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So first of all, the state itself is not uh, fully neutral in this exercise, and certainly any kind of state-private party partnership is not going to be. And the third thing is that uh, the, the role of technology, and I think uh, Pranav very um, rightly highlighted the, the data protection bill, which is currently being, uh, you know, uh, being thought of and will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, passed into law at some point. Uh, it gives a lot of powers, a lot of exceptions to government uh, with respect to data that may pertain even, even to private individuals like uh, the land records, data and so on. You know, there are numerous exceptions uh, under several of the sec sections for government to make data public. So again, I want to draw a distinction between the kind of data that we have put together, which is all government uh, data, which is meant to be publicly accessible, like laws and legal regulations. But things like land record information, which includes the private information of the, of the people, there has to be a debate about, you know, what, what data can be included and what cannot. And let us just be aware of the fact that none of these things are neutral in themselves. So we have to think through very carefully as we think about uh, you know, land data management. I think the best way to go forward is to have multiple uh, stakeholders together. Like the government should make whatever policies it makes, and in whatever way civil society can add to contributing. Uh, you know, add and contribute to to building capacity for the state. That is great, but it has to be through conversation and through dialogue, and not the state deciding for itself the way forward. Thank you, Namita. Uh, we do have a fourth panelist, uh, Prerna Prabhakar at NCAER. Uh, Prerna is working on the issues that we have been discussing. Uh, Prerna, we'd like to hear from you on what sort of work you've been um, doing in terms of building a land information database. Yeah, hi, thanks, Prerna, uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, so um, as Shreya has already mentioned that uh, at NCER, we have been uh, involved in computing an index, which is called NCER Land Records and Services Index. And under the ambit of this index, uh, we are focusing on two broad, two, two broad components. Uh, the first being the extent of digitization of land records uh, in Indian states and UDs. And the second is uh, the quality of to uh, broadly capture the accuracy and the comprehensiveness of land records. And we have many sub-components to these two uh, broad components of the index and based on which we arrive at a score for a state and we have tried to rank states based on the scores that they obtain. So the NLRSI scores, uh, we call it. So uh, one of the observations while doing this work was that um, some states are performing better in some of the parameters of land records, let's say registration. So what we have observed is that a state like Maharashtra is well ahead of other states as far as registration, the digitization of registration process is concerned. So uh, 
even if it is availability of circle rates or online uh, provision for stamp duty payment or uh, getting your registered document uh, attested by the registrar office through a digital signature or even online delivery of the registered document. So Maharashtra is one state that has all these steps digitized and computerized. So the other states have a lot to learn from a state like Maharashtra. Then there are other states uh, that are well ahead of uh, the other states uh, in terms of uh, the legally usable availability of uh, uh, the copies of the record of rights, which we say are the textual records. So uh, there are textual records, there are spatial records, and one of the features that could define how usable these copies that are made available online uh, is that they should be available with a digital signature. That That is something that defines the usability of that copy that is digitized. So uh, there are states that have this provision, but still there are many states that do not have this provision and one has to still go to the revenue department or the office to get the copy uh, from the concerned official. So uh, again, the other states that are lagging behind in, you know, in terms of uh, the provision of legally usable copy online should be adopting uh, you know, the lessons from the states that have already implemented this. So uh, again, then talking about the spatial records, there are different types of uh, digitization that states have adopted. So some states are ahead in terms of uh, the digitization of spatial records because they have vectorized uh, maps available online. But there are some states like Karnataka and uh, Tripura where the maps are there, but then not in a vectorized format. You cannot identify a particular plot on a map uh, and get its information per se. So there's no linkage between uh, the textual record and the spatial record for that particular uh, plot. So in that sense, that uh, spatial record is not that useful. Uh, so, you know, so our observation was that a state, there's no state that completely performs well on all the parameters of land records. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to come up with policy briefs for states to um, help them uh, you know, give policy suggestions and to adopt something that the other states are doing uh, well in. So uh, yeah, so a comparative analysis of states on all these categories of land records has helped us understand that you know, which state is doing well in which uh, category and on which parameter and what that particular state can learn from some other state which is doing well in the other category. So uh, that was one of the observations from uh, the work. And uh, the second critical observation was that uh, for an accurate record and you know, for a record which is, which is available in an updated form, it is very important that you know, these different departments of land records, uh, the revenue department, the survey and settlement department and the registration department are linked closely so that uh, you know, if, a, if, if there's an instance of transaction and a registration takes place, such real-time updating of records uh, for, for it is important for uh, the real-time updating of records that these departments are linked uh, closely. So uh, one of the observations that uh, you know from this work that has come out is that these departments are not linked that efficiently and because of that there's a problem of uh, you know uh, accurate updation of uh, the land records. So for example, uh, the registration department and the revenue department. So the ideal scenario should be that, you know, whenever a, a, a transaction takes place, uh, a mutation, which is like a consequent change in ownership should happen, you know, within like uh, a few days. But then as we see that this, this, this provision, this uh, automatic uh, mutation is missing in all the states. So there is no state which with a provision of automatic mutation that takes place. So as a result of a registration, you know, there's a change in ownership in the textual records. There's no state with such a provision. So the maximum state can have is that because of a registration, there is a note that is automatically sent to uh, you know the textual record, and it appears as a remark that you know such a such on such and such date a transaction took place, and there's there's just a note that appears. 
but only seven states have this provision. So the maximum you know any state has is the provision of this node, but then there are only seven states that have this provision. So from this analysis, we can see how weak is the linkage between you know the departments uh, that are the custodian of land records. Uh, in this case, the registration department and the revenue department. Uh, then possibly another kind of linkage can be between uh, the the survey and settlement department and the uh, revenue department uh, because it is very important. So whatever is reflected in the textual report that are maintained by the revenue department uh, is actually reflected and is consistent with what is uh, maintained by this, uh, the survey and settlement department that are the custodian of uh, the spatial records. But then as we have observed that there's a huge variation between let's say something like land area uh, between the textual record and the spatial record. So uh, the linkage again is missing. And yeah, that is that was another observation that has come out of the work that, you know, to, to have an accurate and an updated record, it is very important that these three departments are well integrated to, to have a better quality of records that are accurate and comprehensive. So these are some of the observations, and now we, are, we will be about the final rankings next week when we launch the index on 27th February. Uh, but then, yeah, these are some of the insights that have uh, come out of the work. Great, thanks, Prerna. Um, And in an ideal world, what is the future for the land data systems that you see in India? Um, accurate, updated, and easily accessible records, or what? What sort of future do you envision? Yeah, definitely uh, a system of accurate, comprehensive land records, because that is, you know, something that is ideal for uh, limited uh, litigation cases and for higher. Uh, transaction intensity. These are the things that are important because uh, one of the things that we have noticed in the work is, like for example, I just give a, give a small example. Uh, there are certain restrictions and conditions that are generally noted in in a in a textual record of a plot of land, like uh, whether there's any if that particular plot is under a mortgage or uh, if there's any revenue court case or a civil court case running on that particular plot. Now, uh, if such things are not updated in, uh, you know, in, in the record uh, of a particular plot of a land and, uh, and a transaction happens, and if, the late, if later the, the transacting party gets to know about uh, you know, the, the actual scenario on uh, with regard to, let's say, uh, a revenue court case on that particular piece of land. So uh, then obviously you have a chance of uh, running a litigation case um, and then, then there are chances of increased disputes. So it's very important that whatever is there on ground, whatever is the reality, should be reflected in, uh, you know, the record. And there should be a system of uh, a software linkage of these department, let's say, uh, these civil court cases and these revenue, sorry, these uh, civil courts and revenue courts, they have their database. So ideally, what we are suggesting is that there should be a database linkage between these courts and uh, the revenue department. So, so that whenever an institution of a revenue court case or a civil court case or any land acquisition proceeding takes place, it should be reflected in uh, the records so that if you know, a potential buyer for a, for that particular plot of land should be aware of uh, these restrictions and conditions. On information that it should be accurate, should be a reflection of the ground situation. Great, thanks Prerna. Um, I am going to ask for last comments from our panelists here before we wrap up, unless there are more questions from participants. Um, Namita, can we begin with you? Uh, do you have any last comments to make to wrap up? Have we lost Namita? Um, Shreya, do you want to um, 
add on to and do you have any more to, and do you have any more remarks? sure Lina. i um would be uh you know i think the conversation that we've had has been very positive can you hear me yeah yes we can hear you yes we can hear you okay great the the conversation i think has been very positive because uh, starting out with uh, you know what we were saying that there's the absence of data there's the dispersal of data but i think from what uh, the the work that prana is uh, talking about uh, which has happened at ncer the, the work that pranab and shreya have mentioned and and our own work i feel like we really have a conversation going about the importance of this issue and a lot of work has been done by all of us together and by others who are not on this panel, but uh, but have been working on these issues. A lot of this information is being put together as we speak, and I think that is a very positive thing to uh, a very positive note to to end with. Um, I just like to add that uh, you know, uh, and I would like to thank uh, Land Portal for bringing us all together uh, because uh, it, it is important for us to know from each other what is what is also going on, and at the same time. Uh, you know, sort of work through some of the, uh, you know, when one database is consolidated with another database, then it leads to a third database. So, and I and I can, you know, see uh, see how all our works can sort of come together to to create even more information uh, that will make the that will make the land se sector less obscure and make land policy perhaps more transparent and more and the government more accountable as we go forward. Great, thanks, Namita. Um, Shreya, do you have some comments Shreya, to wrap up with? Shreya, do you have some comments to wrap up with? Um, sure. Thanks, uh, Rina. I think uh, I agree with Namita. We've had a very good uh, conversation. For, I mean, I'm glad we're discussing this topic, the fact that we need more data and information and it's an entire ecosystem. So multiple stakeholders need to come to the table. Um, it's great to have this dialogue going forward. It's great. It's very uh, encouraging to hear all the positive success stories that other panelists have mentioned. Um, Prena shared a lot of good stuff that's happening in the state governments. So I do think government is also moving ahead in the right direction. Um, yeah, and hopefully we are, uh, you know, we are at the tipping point when things will just start moving at a much faster pace than they have in the past. Thanks, Shreya. Uh, Pranab, what are your closing remarks? Yeah, I think uh, the land ecosystem in India is expanding with a lot of you know, non stacked actors coming in and working around that. So it will grow. And there is also a kind of, I would say, three way pressure points to bring in more data and information for a better functioning of democracy and development. One is from the global uh, angle, which SDG is trying to put a pressure to report good quality data and provide a monitoring framework the way land rights are advancing. So in that context, no. Uh, I think good progress will be made. Now, Government of India started this uh, dashboard on SDG. Though in women land rights space, they are only reporting the agriculture census data. But as per SDG requirement, they have to provide annual data, uh, data sets and more, and more granular. So I think that will be you know, progress towards that. The national level, as uh, you know, Parana study indicates, that you know, that there are issues uh, still there, though computerization has really provided a good ecosystem. So now government of India looking at conclusive titling, which is incumbent upon a data, which is updated data where textual, actual and spatial records sync. So in that context, I think investments are going to come in and the land record data system at the national level will go up. But more important in the Indian context at the state level, state state is uh, in India land is state subject and state uh, depending upon their legal system, land uh, data are organized and uh, uh, disseminated. And if the advocacy has to be done, if the democracy has to work around land issues, so at the state level, data should be available and the stakeholder at the state level should be involved in not only data use, but also in data collection and data management. So that is something is very important in Indian context and we have really strengthened how different state actors get engaged in this you know, land database, both in land records as well as in terms of other database, qualitative and quantitative database, and which will really make the you know, the land democracy and land governance function better. Thanks, Prana. Um, we are going to wrap up this session there. Um, I know it's a lot of information to take in. 
uh, land portal will be sending through a link to the webinar. Thank you so much for joining and for your questions. We do apologize for the technical difficulties that we encountered. Um, a big thanks to our panelists, Namita at the Center for Policy Research, Shreya at Omidya Network India, and Pranab at NRMC, and Prerna at NCAER. Thanks so much to Land Portal for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rena, for a great moderation. <laughs>